Welcome back to Science and Sanity. Hello, Steve. Introduce yourself. Hello. I am Steve again. Every I'm time. Back. We're, we're doing it every time. It's just, hello, I am Steve. I have learned nothing. Let's go again. Round two. Today, <laughs> in, the, in the last episode, we, sh we, should, we should briefly cover the last episode. In the last one, the pilot episode, we covered the super general basics of the Battletech universe. What time frame we're working with, what the kind of universe is, the economic and technological situation we're in, how all the stuff works, like FTL and the economy, and how humanity got from one planet of dirty, smelly apes to several thousand planets of dirty, smelly apes. And we kind of went over each of the factions with their own, like, 15, 20-minute-ish section. Today, though, this, this is the only thing that we probably should have started with as the pilot video, actually, because this is probably the only thing most people know about Battletech. It's the only thing they give a shit about, but... Battle Mechs! The big, stompy robots of the 31st millennium. The greatest part of this universe and what everybody knows. Big, stompy war machines that are fitted out with way too many guns and nobody actually bothered to figure out how the ammo feed works in these stupid things. So, Steve, you ready to learn about Robo Combat? I am. Very, very exciting stuff today. Very exciting stuff today. Can I All wait? Right. I'd like, I'd like to start us off with a quote, something that explains the state of BattleTech perfectly. You, you have, you've been, uh, you've been mostly educated about how backwards technology is. The general quote partially of educated. BattleTech, partially educated. The general quote of BattleTech goes along the lines of "Kill the meat, save the metal." Because you can always make more mech pilots. All you need is a man and a woman to do the sideways monster mash, and there you go. Give it a few years. Sideways monster mash, baby. Let's go. Give it, a, give it a few years, man. Give it a few years, and you got yourself a new mech pilot. The battle mechs, however, a lot of them take years and unbelievable amounts of money to build, or you will never be rebuilding them again. There's some like the Atlas II or the Royal Star League variants of stuff like the King Crab and the Marauder, which can never be rebuilt. The factories and technology and stuff required to do it is lost to history, nuked into oblivion. The general idea of that quote is that the men are so worthless that you aim for the head, you aim for the cockpit, because it's better to slaughter and melt the pilot into slag than it is to damage the actual battle mech. And that describes mech combat perfectly. I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you the option here. Would you like to start with what the mechs are, or would you look, like to start with what the mechs do? Start with what the mechs are. All right, well, we'll start with a brief history lesson. Mechs in Battletech actually came about because of three specific advancements all happening roughly within the same time. Mechs first emerged around the late 30 or 2500 25 oh my god I'm getting all the dates wrong. The mechs first came around. The first mech came out in the late 2300s. It was called the Mackie. It was the first battle mech ever built and it revolutionized warfare. The reason that the Terran hegemony turned into the Star League and became so successful is because they invented battle mechs first and they started wrecking shop with them basically immediately. All the other great houses basically tried as hard as possible and went out of their way to steal information on the Mackie because they were that scared of it. The reason battle mechs actually took over from regular combined arms warfare, because, you know, like, battle mechs are the star, but you still have combined arms. You still have infantry, the poor ground-pounding sods, you still have tanks and artillery, you have aircraft and helicopters and stuff. It's just that battle mechs take the center stage, you know? The, the big advancements that led to battle mechs being feasible was the invention of myomer, a special type of synthetic muscle, the miniaturization of reactor technology, and the neural interface with the actual mech. So the, the reactor is the easiest one to explain. Most vehicles use conventional engines, right? And if they didn't use conventional engines, they were electric to operate in vacuum. Otherwise, they'd be using like regular diesel turbine engines and stuff like that to move tanks and artillery around. Uh, mm -hmm. Or which is like, like regular, regular vehicles, right? Because remember, it's only like 200 years in the future from where we are today. I don't imagine that in 200 years, suddenly the US is going to be walking around with battle mechs and nuclear reactor powered power armor, right? It's just, it's not happening. Most likely not. Most likely not, right? So once they miniaturized these reactors, 
That was the biggest thing. They could power the battle mechs finally. The second biggest one that actually made them feasible, because there were some test beds, for example, where it was like an, an upper torso of a mech mounted on top of a tank. However, myomer is a special type of synthetic muscle. When you put electricity through it, it contracts with a force many times greater than like hydraulic pistons while being significantly lighter and way stronger than steel. It's basically like a super material, like carbon nanotube muscle kind of thing. So what this did, let basically me, let me find a carbon fires revolutionary impact or yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty much. Let me, let me actually find a picture of it to show you. Okay, there you go. So that's, that's what Myomer looks like. It, it's literally synthetic muscle. So when you look at the battle mechs and you see all of these crazy like armor panels and stuff, directly underneath that isn't pistons and gyros and little motors. It's literally big anchor points that the Myomer is tied to and then like human muscle structure almost underneath that allows the mech to move. Oh, that, that does in fact look like a human muscle structure, yes. Yeah, it's it's a little it's a little freaky when you actually look at it. Um, that's also why the mechs have certain limits on how they can move and rotate around. Like, you know, in a, in a lot of sense, like a mech reasonably should be able to turn its torso all the way around. You just put it on ball bearings, but it's not using a motor or a ball bearing system to turn the torso. It's got muscle groups laid around its chest like an actual human does that allows it to turn, and they can only stretch so far before they can't stretch any farther, which is why the mechs can only rotate between 90 to 60 degrees left or right from center. Same thing with the arms. They can only raise their arms or move their legs a certain amount. And the other thing is that the myomer, just like regular muscle, the more of it there is, the more powerful it is. So uh, an assault mech that has really big legs, if you were to put like a light mech chassis on that thing, it would be sprinting across the continent because those legs would be turbo powered, but they need to right. be that big to hold all the weight from the big turbo guy, right? And so mechs are a very, a very freaky type of uh, science fiction vehicle. It's very different from what you get in most other kinds of science fiction thing. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the biggest change, what allowed people to control the mechs, because they were having a lot of trouble actually programming them to self-balance, programming them to work, was not was that going neuro interface? Well. That was the neuro interface that solved that problem, because it was really difficult for someone to pilot a mech that walked almost like a human, but the human pilot had no ability to, to balance the mech. Their center of balance and center of gravity was so thrown off because the cockpit is in the head, but the center of mass could be literally anywhere else in the mech depending on how it was designed. So the, right. neural, the neural interface isn't quite like what a lot of people think, right? You look at something like uh, like Halo, and the Spartans have their neural interface with uh, their armor, and it's almost like the armor becomes a second skin. They can feel what the armor feels, they move it like it's a second skin, they have no problem with it. That's not what it is in Battletech. In Battletech, um, machines and basically dumb AI programs still balance the mechs and let them move around and compensate for the shock of getting hit by weapons and stuff, but the neural link allows the human to kind of extend their senses to feel how the mech is behaving. For example, the pilot will be able to feel if the ground is uneven and can then take steps to change his piloting to make his footing a little bit better. He can feel if the mech is starting to tilt or feel if it's starting to overheat, but he doesn't actually feel the sensations. It's like having having like a, a sixth sense that lets him know what's going on with the mech without needing to have all of the readouts in front of him. Now, this is an Im it's an imperfect system. Yeah, so it, it's an imperfect system. So in the cockpit, all of the mechs still have readouts for like torso twist angle, how far you're looking, where your guns are, what the reload or cooldown of your weapons are, how much heat has been built up, how fast your, uh, your heat sinks are getting rid of that built up heat, you know, is your reactor working at 100 to 0% efficiency, that kind of stuff. They still need all of those technical readouts, but the, the neural interface allows them to kind of feel how the mech is working. Instead of having to look at the screen every 
yeah yeah the, every three the, seconds the easiest analogy would be like if a tank crewman plugged into his vehicle could kind of feel if the tracks were slipping over loose gravel rather than biting into hard dirt right like that's the easiest way mm -hmm. to kind of kind of give an example uh, the other cool thing about it is it comes with a few additions, like uh, old mechs will have gauntlets that the pilot wears, like the Power Glove, the old Nintendo Power Glove, right? And that's <laughs> that's for punching the shit out of things. Some mechs that don't have arms and will instead use their legs for melee will have, like, leg braces. <laughs> Those exist? <laughs> yes, they do. If a mech doesn't have arms and doesn't have like gimbaled arms, then they'll use their legs to kick things or to step on things. And the way that that works is the pilot uses the neural uplink coupled with those power gloves to literally make the motion of punching in his cockpit and the dumb AI or computer systems in the mech will approximate it as best they can and punch with the mech's arm. So normally when they're just walking around shooting things, the arms are like locked to their side. The mech isn't doing all these weird humanoid movements. It's just kind of trundling along and shooting things. But when the mm -hmm. pilot takes direct control, it mimics the pilot's actions. Again, the pilot doesn't feel this. It's a mix of the neural uplink kind of transferring his thoughts and the computer guesstimating what he's doing. So a battle mech could like walk up slowly to an enemy and then all of a sudden, wha-bam, throw a left hook directly into the face of an enemy mech. <laughs> okay. It's a really silly analogy, but it, that's what it is. That's how it works. It sounds dumb, but that's how it be. That's how mech melee and stuff works. Oh. Yeah, the some uh, some battle mechs, like the for the clans, for example, they have like super advanced computers. They can just click a button on a joystick and the mech will figure out what you're aiming at and like punch for you. But for the most part, the inner sphere uses the good old fashioned neural uplink and shadow boxing the enemy to make melee work. The good old combination of uh, Pacific Rim and real steel. Good old combination, yeah. So that's that's what battle mechs are, right? That's, that's what they be, it's what they do. There's a couple different classes of them and each of them is designed to do different things. The smallest and fastest and least armored and armed version are light mechs. These range anywhere from ultra light mechs that are 10 tons and this is basically just a souped up suit of power armor to the 20 to 25 ton light mechs, which are your, your standards, right? These are like your locusts. These are like your adders, stuff like that. You don't know what those are, but I'm posting pictures up on screen for the viewers. Uh, they are small, fast, usually come equipped with some kind of ECM or something to protect them because if they get hit, there's a good chance that they're getting parts and components blasted off immediately because they just don't have survivability. These, these are generally used for, for scouting and stuff. So moving up past the, the light mechs, then you start getting into like the actually common mechs. Light mechs aren't used too much because they don't really have combat potential. They're just for scouting and stuff and maybe harassing enemies. But medium mechs are where you really start to see like the battle tech style of murdering each other slowly, like pummeling each other to death. These guys range from like 35 tons to like 45 tons. Generally, they carry a varied suite of weapons like long range missiles or lasers. They'll carry auto cannons. They're, they're the bulk of most armies in the setting because they're easy to produce, they're effective, and they're a good mix of armor, survivability, utility, and firepower. They're, they're your all rounders. So basically, the cruisers of uh, the current era of a modern naval fleet. Pretty much, yeah. They they make up everything you need them to do. Some of them are even loaded out to be anti-air platforms, like uh, one of them called the Rifleman was basically designed to be an AA platform first and foremost, and then a fire support mech. Some of them are designed to be just a walking cannon, like for example, the Hunchback has a massive hunch on one side of it. That thing, that hunch is filled with either really insanely big weapons or a shitload of weapons. And that guy, that person in particular, he's gonna die. I'm gonna fire all my guns with him. Screw him. Screw him. <laughs> moving on from medium, medium mechs are, are pretty flexible, right? But moving on from medium mechs, you have heavy mechs. And these are not as rare as assault mechs, but they're still fairly rare. Cause building good heavy mechs is difficult, it's slow, and it takes a lot of time. These are your like 55 to 75 ton mechs. 
they'll often be hefting around a lot of firepower. They're not very fast, but they're very survivable. Uh, they have a tendency to just be the juggernauts of the battlefield. They're going to sit there and they're going to trade very effective heavy fire with enemies from long range and they're going to blast each other to bits. These are like your, your classic Battletech vehicles. If you see like two big mechs duking it out, it's probably heavy mechs, if not assault mechs. So, damn, I, was, I don't know what the comparison I was getting ready to make. I had it and then I lost it. <laughs> Brain.exe is not working right now. <laughs> What's the armor on? What's the armor on these like? Because you said they're survivable. But... Uh, you know what? That's a that's a good that's a good point actually. I don't think we talked about the armor. Um, in the era of thirty twenty five, which is when most of the lore starts, that's like the we went over this. That's like the canonical start of the the era, the lore and stuff, right? There's really only special like alloy laminate armor, and the way mm -hmm. that armor works for battle mechs is it absorbs energy because the armor has to protect you from lasers it has to protect you from kinetics and it has to protect you from missiles right so all the okay. different types of weapons that you could imagine fit into that the armor has to protect from all of it so basically the way it works is as the armor takes damage it kind of vaporizes or cracks apart to to get rid of that energy so if a laser hits the armor, the armor just kind of like melts and vaporizes away, but the laser doesn't actually do any damage or transfer any energy to anything else below it, right? That's why, like, even though lasers generate a shitload of heat, they're not going to overload the heat sinks of an enemy mech. If an autocannon round or like an artillery or a missile or something hits it, then the armor will shatter off and absorb that energy. So when battle... Actually, you know what? I have a really good image to display exactly what's happening. So when battle mechs take damage, they don't get components destroyed, right? It's not like where a tank, where if the tank armor gets penetrated, then the tank is destroyed, right? Or takes stupid right, heavy yeah. damage that cripples it. Battle mechs literally have to blast each other to pieces. You're, you're not one hit killing an enemy mech unless you manage to snipe the pilot, which is super rare. Killing the meat to save the metal is very difficult. But these battle mechs... They will literally have to melt and carve chunks off of each other, carving through their armor in order to actually do damage. And the battles get real brutal. Mech pilots will try to like torso twist away. They'll try to get you to, instead of focusing your lasers on one point, like spread your laser out like a line across a whole bunch of armor to salvage, like to minimize the damage that you do and stuff. It's it's very, <laughs> very interesting, right? In, in the image I posted... Um, I don't know what the, the front mech is. I don't recognize that back profile, but the one further back is an Atlas. I recognize that one. I think that one is an Atlas 2 or an Atlas 3, because that doesn't look like your standard, like, Atlas 1. Okay. Regardless, though, those are, th uh, those are assault mechs. Heavy mechs, they engage similarly, but they're not quite as tough. Assault mechs are like the creme de la creme. They are your super battleships. They are your main battle tank kind of thing. And they are absolutely covered in armor. They are super heavily armed. Heavy mechs engage with each other at all ranges. They're good for open field battles. They're good for like defense or offense. Assault mechs. Right, right. Assault mechs are a sledgehammer. You only bring these guys out when you look at an enemy position and say, I don't want to see it anymore. Because assault mechs will walk at the enemy and annihilate everything in front of them. If you don't have assault mechs to counter, there's a good chance you're just going to get run over. Otherwise, you're going to have to use some real good tactics to take these suckers down. And, as befits their status, they're almost impossible to make. Very few assault mechs are actually made anymore in the Battletech universe by the time of 3025. And a few of them that are made are generally super toned down. Like the King Crab, for example. The good old, good old Steppy Boy. Steppy Boy is my favorite. Let me, let me find an image of a King Crab for you because they are, they are my favorite mech. They cannot actually be built in their original configuration anymore because the original Star League version of it was lost tech, right? It's it's irrecoverable. Okay. It, can't, it can't be rebuilt. And the modern versions of it have worse guns, worse engines, worse heat sinks, less armor because they couldn't replicate the advanced armor alloys that the Star League had and stuff. 
All right, there you go. That's the king crab, right? You see how it's got the big auto cannons and it's in its like little arm pincers. You see how it's got all of the missile racks on its uh, its left shoulder <laughs> and all the lasers on its right shoulder. This thing is yeah. great. Like the the king crab was designed during the Star League era, and its entire purpose was build me an assault mech that can kill any other mech on the battlefield with a single alpha strike salvo. That's its whole purpose. Yeah, yeah, that thing looks like, like you could do that, yeah. Giant guns. By the way, the cockpit is the tiny center part that you see glowing. All those glowing panels, that's not the mm -hmm. cockpit. That's to throw off people's aim. Because at really long distances, people will be like, oh, is that glowing bit the cockpit? And then they'll miss when they shoot for it and just hit like a, a painted armored section, right? It's only the tiny little <laughs> section in the center. So the person is very small. This is an enormous mech. This thing is 100 tons. It's huge. The thing is as well, it's so rare and it's so heavy hitting that it's it's known as a it's known as a hanger queen because nobody ever brings it out. The risk of losing such a valuable mech is so high that nobody would bring it out except in the most dire of circumstances. And the other problem is that most assault mechs, just like the King Crab, are are so like they hit so hard and they're so powerful that deploying one is gross overkill on whatever you're using it against. I mean, if you're basically guaranteed not to lose it though why wouldn't you just why wouldn't you use it for most situations uh well i mean another thing you have to keep in mind is it costs a lot of money to drop these things from orbit onto the surface of the planet so like the cost goes up the more weight there is you don't generally want to be dropping like five thousand tons of battle mech for something that you could do with like a quarter of the weight right you know economics and all that um also there are these things called mech screens, and they're like these massive walls of like concrete and reinforced steel, mm -hmm. and they're meant to stop mechs from being able to shoot in or walk through, right? They're like big barriers to protect a base, right? The enemy battle mechs have to fight their way through the entrance rather than just surrounding or walking through the walls, yeah? Right. Assault mechs are usually big enough to just punch their way through that shit. They don't even care. I said, said, I see your wall. I raise you this fist. <laughs> yeah, they, they don't have to, like, you can destroy the walls, obviously, but most assault mechs don't have to actually shoot them. They can just walk into them, and their raw girth will destroy them. It's it's great. So those are the four types of mechs. There are a few outstanding ones as well, like super light mechs, which are like five tons, and then there are super heavy mechs, which are or like super assault mechs, which are like 130, 140 tons, but they're super rare. They don't crop up until like way later in the lore and not really worth talking about. Um, moving on from that, the weapons that the battle mechs use and why they're mounted where they are. So in all the images that you see, you'll notice like big hard points for the weapons. Like the guns are in the arms, they got lasers in the side torsos or missiles up on the back or something, right? And the reason right. for this is because each mech has to be designed to carry a certain loadout of weapons. So for example, right, because the Mimer muscles have to wrap around the whole mech to allow it to move, you have to plan out ahead of time what weapon slots and weapon bays there's going to be so that they don't interfere with the Mimer. You can't just cut a hole into the torso of a mech and add a new weapon in there because you might sever the Mimer bundles that let the mech use its arm and then the entire arm is useless. You got to replace the whole goddamn thing. <laughs> I could see it happening though. Yeah, they're, they're, there's something called pirate mechs, which are basically like pirates who steal destroyed battle mechs. And when they rebuild them, they're absolute shit heaps. Sometimes they don't even work. Sometimes they explode because they don't know how to actually work on mechs. They're not proper like engineers and stuff. And... They, they tend to ruin everything they touch. But yeah, so mm -hmm. mechs are designed with different weapon loadouts. You might have like a zero, like the King Crab 0000 is the royal variant. It's like the original variant of the King Crab. This thing is loaded mm -hmm. out with the super heavy auto cannons. It's loaded out with a whole bunch of precision missiles and like heavy lasers and stuff. And it's, it's running like special ferrofibrous armor, more armor for less weight. It's got all this fancy shit in it, right? And then you have modern versions of it. You have like the King Crab K, for example, or you might have an entirely different version. Like each great house has their own different version. The, uh, the King Crab 007, 
is a federated commonwealth one. It was invented when the Lyrian commonwealth and the federated sons were working together, and it's like a special blend of each of their specialties. It's got the rapid-firing autocannons of the federation, and it's got the fancy big missiles and lasers of Steiner. So each battle right. mech has different loadouts depending on what faction is making it. The energy weapons of the Free Worlds League, they're really big into energy weapons. They replaced all of the auto cannons with a whole bunch of uh, particle projector cannons, plasma rifles, and lasers because that's what they specialize in. The different weapon hardpoints also contribute to how the different mechs are used. If you wanted to build, it's called a laser boat or a laser vomit, right? Where if you have a ton of energy hardpoints, you could mount a few big plasma weapons or a particle projector cannon or something to attack people at long range, or you could mount an absolute assload of medium and large lasers. Uh, a laser vomit mech might run up to you and fire like an entire rainbow of lasers at you because the different laser sizes are different colors. You have like red, green, yellow, light blue, dark blue. Ah, uh, yeah, it's just like the old school shell tracers. Oh, indeed, right? So the battle mech runs up and goes, taste the rainbow, motherfucker, and just melts half your mech off with one go. <laughs> and... <laughs> and, uh, and, the mech, and the mech pilot prays he doesn't overheat his reactor and goes critical when he does this. You have other <laughs> stuff... Fireballs. <laughs> yeah, you have other stuff, which is like DACA builds, which uh, they mount ultra auto cannons in there, and they like to engage at medium range. Uh, ultra auto cannons are like regular auto cannons, but they don't have a fire rate cap. The regular auto cannons are like a bolt action rifle loading. They fire the shell, eject the uh, casing, reload another shell from an ammo feed into an ammo hopper. That's how auto mm -hmm. cannons work. An ultra auto cannon is like a semi automatic where it fires as fast as you click the trigger, but there's a very high chance that you'll jam the weapon while firing. So DACA mechs will load up a ton of auto cannons, a ton of ultra auto cannons, and they're just letting rip with shells from medium to long range. Ammo and weighs. Hope they don't jam. <laughs> and hope they don't jam. Yeah. Um, auto cannon builds tend to have way less armor and be less survivable, just like missile boat builds, because ammo weighs a shitload and you have to sacrifice a lot of armor weight in order to carry a ton of ammo. Sometimes. Oh my god, you will have my favorite weapon in the entire game. So, an autocannon 2 is like the smallest autocannon you can have. The 2 is roughly for how effective it is in game-wise. It does 2 damage, right? Where an autocannon 20 does 20 damage. And they scale, okay. they scale in size and effect. In terms of real world, an AC-2 is like a 90mm gun. Like a 90 to 100mm cannon, right? Okay. <laughs> an AC-5 is like a 120 to a 130. Like, it's it's a big gun. It's the kind of gun that you would see mounted on, like, World War I cruisers and stuff. It's a, it's a beefy gun. There is a there is a gun that almost is, is, is almost exclusively used by heavy and assault mechs. It's called the Rack, the rotary autocannon. The biggest one there is is a Rack 5. It is three 130 millimeter barrels that rotate like a Gatling cannon and just fire as fast as they can. And I love that weapon. <laughs> it is the stupidest weapon ever. It makes no sense. How does this weapon manage to not jam when, an, when a UAC jams? I have no idea, but it does. And it's great. We don't question. <laughs> we don't question it. Your, your average rack enjoyer, you know, that there's an innuendo in there. Um, <laughs> somewhere, somewhere. Don't have to look too far. <laughs> don't look. Don't have to look too far. Your your average rack enjoyer doesn't shoot the enemy to destroy them. They point the guns at the enemy and literally pummel the enemy mech to pieces by sheer volume of shells. It doesn't matter if he can't penetrate your armor. It doesn't matter if it's going to take him forever to get through your armor. He is going to literally bury you in shells. It is amazing. And there's a version of the King Crab that has two of them, and I love it. It's so fucking good. That's got to be your favorite one ever, right? Oh, that's my favorite one. It's a hero version of the mech. In Mech Warrior Online, that's the one I use. It's got four large lasers, two rack twos, and a bunch of SRMs. It is the definition of face check me and find out. It's so fun. Someone rips around the corner when I'm using that mech, and they're just like, ah, oh, King Crab, he's not going to one-shot me. And you're like, yeah, you're right, I won't. But it doesn't matter. I'm taking one of your arms with me. Get over here, motherfucker. <laughs>
It's fantastic. The, the weapons are great. When you get into the missiles that battle mechs will use, right? There are... Mm -hmm. <sighs> There's like, there's like four kinds, okay? There are ATMs, SRMs, LRMs, and MRMs. Uh, advanced tactical missiles, ATMs are missiles that come with a variable payload depending on how they're used. In the lore and on tabletop, you have to carry like three different types of ammunition, but the way that you see them uh, portrayed in most video games or in most modern depictions is that the farther the missile is away from your target, so like the farther the missile has to travel to get to its target, the less damage it will deal. So it's kind of like high risk, high reward. They're effective at way longer ranges than short range missiles and they do as much damage at close range, but they're they're more useful. Those are more of a clan thing, though. The clans generally use those weapons. A clan um, moment. Yeah. Uh, you have short-range missiles, which are generally short-range. They hit incredibly hard, and they are very big missiles. They do an ass load of damage, and mechs that walk around with loadouts of, like, SRMs, they fire all of them at once, they're probably going to just destroy light and medium mechs, like just instantly kill them because the amount of damage they do is insane. You'll you'll blow what their torso off. What type of ranges are we talking about with the uh, with the short ranges? Very short range. You're like 300, 400 meters below. Like very, okay. very short range. Point blank range, right? Yeah, that that's basically a mech's length less than. Yeah, pretty much. Like you, you got to be right on top of them. And long mm -hmm. range missiles do the least damage because they need to have the most fuel, and they are almost always tracking only if you fire them hot loaded which is point shoot activate the warhead they have a chance of damaging the launcher they might explode in the launcher right because the warhead activates after a few seconds of flight to guarantee that mm -hmm. it's not going to damage it they can also be shot down lrms are fairly slow there's a lot of anti-missile systems that can shoot them down srms though very fast very difficult for uh anti-missile systems to shoot them down but, I mean, if a mech is like... Well, it also doesn't have much time to shoot him down with that range. Yeah, also, if the mech is only like 200 meters away, you probably have way, way bigger problems because that mech can punch you. And he probably will if he's willing to get that close. So, mech tactics. Let's let's briefly go over mech tactics because there's there's a little bit to cover here. Using, okay. using battle mechs is kind of like rock, paper, scissors, okay? An assault mech can be taken apart by several light mechs working together if they know what they're doing. If an assault mech gets isolated, they generally can't turn their torso very far and they can't turn very fast, so it's very easy for light mechs to get behind them and just start shredding their weaker rear armor, trying to destroy their reactor or crit out their components and kill them. So light mech hunting parties are surprisingly common, and it's very, very bad for a heavy mech or an assault mech to get caught out in the middle of nowhere with no support. So light mechs tend to love forming up into little hunting parties to scout or harass enemy flanks and stuff, while okay. medium mechs act kind of as their counter. So generally light mechs are like the probing front line of mech combat. They'll look to turn flanks or to get around an enemy's rear or to generally sneak behind the enemy's lines and harass their supplies and stuff. And medium mechs are their counter, right? So in real life you had, you had cruisers, which were like the counter to destroyers, because cruisers were fast enough to chase destroyers down, but they were heavily armed and armored enough that they would just kill them in a fight. And it's the same thing with medium mechs. Medium mechs are fast enough often to catch light mechs, but way more heavily armed and armored, so they're capable of outright winning that fight. They're, they're your flexible reaction force. Medium mechs can assist in an assault by being support fire platforms with heavy hitting weapons. They can be your rear guard. They can be your quick reaction force. They love to be employed basically in every way that you can imagine. They, they do everything okay, but nothing amazing. Jack of all trades, master of none. Jack of all trades, master of none. Um, some medium mechs are really, really stupid, like the Hunchback, who is big and heavy and slow and just, it, it's just hefting around a lot of really beefy weapons, so it's it's more closer to a heavy mech than anything else, but generally, mm -hmm. yeah, medium mechs are your jacks of all trade. Um, heavy mechs are your line holders. They, they are the theater front line force. You deploy heavy mechs as the main part of your assault. You deploy them as the main part of your defense. 
if you need an armored spearhead, if you need like maneuver warfare with heavy firepower elements, the heavy mech is what you want to go with because they are not super slow. They're still they're still on the slower side, but they're pretty damn quick. They can move like 70, 80 kilometers per hour. They're fucking fast when they need to be. But they're hard hitting uh -huh. enough and heavily armored enough and flexible enough with their weapons that they're usually like the center point of any battle line. If heavy mechs are being brought out, it's usually because they're going to be the deciding factor in a mech engagement. They're the ones that are going to be deciding the conflict, right? If they get fucked up, then you've probably lost. If they fuck the enemy up, then you've probably won. And when it comes to assault mechs, their tactics, like we talked about briefly, are basically to be a sledgehammer. Except in Battletech, assault mechs are actually quite rare. It's extremely rare to see them deployed on the field of battle in any appreciable numbers, because their role is no longer really a thing that happens. Mech engagements between factions are normally on the smaller scale. It's like, you know, maybe like 10 to 20 battle mechs might be an entire theater, uh -huh. right? An, an entire okay. city, a massive city is being fought over by like 20, 20 battle mechs on each side. And they're divvied up into groups of four or five, right? So the right. engagements are small scale and they're spread out because they don't have the scale anymore. But back during the days of the Star League... Assault mechs were exactly that. They would basically operate as a giant goon squad. You get like a whole bunch of assault mechs together, you line them up like linebackers shoulder to shoulder, and off they go. Anything that gets in front of them dies. Anything that's roughly off to their side dies. And they'll usually be walking in front of a number of heavy mechs and medium mechs that serve as their support. They are like the spearhead to take over a city. Like if the enemy's got a big, heavy entrenched battle line outside of a city, you would use assault mechs to smash a hole clear through that, allowing your heavy mechs to start getting in and fighting the enemy while medium and light mechs acted to pick off stragglers and kind of poke at the enemy's flanks, right? It's not mm -hmm. used too much anymore because... And you don't want to deploy all of them in one situation? Yeah, I mean, the the absolute disaster would be you deploy a whole bunch of assault mechs and then somebody nukes them and you're like, well, fuck. Well, well I guess we're done. <laughs> I guess that's that, ladies and gentlemen. Nukes aren't used too often in Battletech. They are used frequently enough that we should mention it. But because of something called the Ares Conventions, which are... Um, like rules of warfare in the future, they're not used. They're not used very often. They're they're used very rarely. And that uh, that basically concludes mechs. The only other thing we could realistically talk about would be the different uh, employments of them in the great house militaries. The difference between the clan mechs, but they deserve an entire video unto themselves. And uh, yeah, got any questions? Anything else you want to ask or talk about them? Would you like to look over a few different kinds of mechs? There are many to enjoy. I, I would like to go over a few different other kinds of mechs, but particularly the, the assault mechs. Um. All right, well, the King Crab is my personal favorite, but why don't we look at the literal face of the franchise, the Atlas Battle Mech, the good old chunky boy. This is the face of Battletech. This is the classic mech, right? Let me let me find a mm -hmm. good image that really does this chunky bastard justice. The Atlas stands a little bit taller than the King Crab does, but that's because the King Crab has that bow-legged design and the Atlas is more like a dude standing up, right? Yeah, I, I could tell that from yeah. the previous so, picture that you sent. <laughs> yeah, so, so there's the Atlas, right? This is the classic assault mech. He has, uh, he's got some lasers in his arms. He has a massive auto cannon in his side torso. He has a shitload of short range missiles all over the place. The Atlas is the quintessential assault mech. Super heavily armored. Every part of this thing is just beefed up. It walks at the enemy. It blasts the shit out of them. And if anything is still standing by the time it gets there, it punches the ever loving Jesus out of it because it has reinforced <laughs> battle fists. <laughs> reinforced battle fists. No, I'm not joking. That's a real thing. If you look at the, I, I if, believe you. Yeah, if if you look at the battle fists, you can actually see it in the lore. You see how there's that like uh, little triangular thing inside the hands? Mm -hmm. That's like brass knuckles. That's to reinforce the fingers so they don't crumple. 
So when the Atlas punches you, it's got a giant hunk of metal behind that fist that's coming in right after it. <laughs> oh god, that's great. It's a it's a great mech. The Atlas is a classic. Oh god, I wanna I wanna show you I wanna show you this mech. It's so it's so fucking good. This uh this Marauder okay. this Marauder kit bash. It is this is this is one of my this is one of my favorite fan made Marauders. This would never work, by the way. These guns are way too heavy. The Marauder would never be able to carry these. But this is a heavy mech. It's a Marauder, as you can see. It's, uh, <laughs> what, it's, what does uh, this look like the Queen Alien? <laughs> because uh, it kind of it kind of does. It kind of does. This this is the modern Marauder. I'd like to point out that the Marauder in general has gone through like five different redesigns over its BattleTech history, and each one looks significantly different from each other. This is the okay. current. This is the current one that is. It's it's a new miniature in the tabletop game. It's the one that shows up in the video games like BattleTech and, and Rogue Tech and stuff. Uh, like Mech Warrior mm -hmm. 5. Uh, and this is a kit bash. There, there is no way in hell a Marauder would ever be able to carry this many guns. It's got six large lasers mounted in the hands, as you can see. It's got a rotary, yes. it's got a rotary autocannon, an AC5, and an LBX AC20. The L LBX basically means Giga Shotgun. It's it's like a 200 millimeter shotgun. Is that the top one? That's the big top one, yeah. And it's got a whole bunch of LRMs in the left torso. So this this would never <laughs> this would never work. This could never this could never move. It would die. It would collapse under its own weight. But I love it. It looks so silly. It's it's one of my one of my favorite things. Um, let's uh, let's show you. Let's show you a few clan mechs, why don't we? We'll start with uh, we'll start with my favorite clan mech, the one, the only, the Huntsman. God, I fucking love this thing. The biggest difference between inner sphere mechs and clan mechs, aside from just having better weapons for the clans and like better armor and stuff, is that the clans have omni mechs. Remember how I told you that you can't switch out a kinetic piece for, like, a laser weapon slot without taking apart yeah. the whole mech? The clans mm -hmm. don't actually have to abide by that because their mechs are modular. Omni-mech means that the you can take a part of it off and replace it with a different part, and it works just fine. So the Huntsman... <laughs> The Huntsman is an Omni-Mech. You can load this thing out with whatever you want. If you wanted to, you could run, like, 50 SRMs in the Huntsman. Like, massive fists with nothing but uh, SRMs. Your shoulders are SRMs. Your torso is SRMs. Gra I love it. Uh, you'll notice as well, it has a rotary autocannon, too, in its left arm. Mm, mwah. Yeah. Love it. I absolutely love it. Um, the Huntsman is jump jet capable. It's not particularly well armored, but, uh, it's super flexible. It does, it does literally everything. Um, and everything while, while we're at it, while we're at it, I'm going to show you the Timberwolf. Because, okay. so the Atlas is the face of the inner sphere. The Timberwolf, this thing, or more accurately, the Mad Cat, because, I, you know what? I gotta, I gotta explain it to you. I gotta explain it to you. Okay. Okay. The Timberwolf was originally identified by the Inner Sphere when the clans invaded as the Mad Cat because it looks like a mix between a Marauder and a Catapult. And the Inner Sphere targeting computer couldn't figure out which mech it was, so it kept flipping back and forth between Marauder and Catapult, and so eventually it was Mad Cat. So they called it the Mad Cat. Okay. Its actual name is the Timberwolf. It is a heavy mech. It is the face of the clan battle tech. It's it's basically the clan version of the Marauder, in my opinion. That's probably heresy to a lot of people, but it's loaded out with tons of heavy weapons. It's pretty fast. It's got a very narrow, low profile, and it carries a huge array of weapons, and it's just a beast. I love that thing. It's really good. I like the cockpit on this thing. Oh, the cockpit is great. The the Mad Cat looks absolutely, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, and those are those are some of your different mechs, right? They come in all shapes and sizes. I'm not going to bother with the light mechs because they all suck. I don't care if you like them. They're all crap. Medium mechs is where the fun starts. And that's battle mechs. From how they work to how the pilot controls them to what they do, the classes and the weapons they use and stuff. All right. <laughs> battle mechs. Big stompy robots that shoot and then proceed to punch the shit out of each other. And just like all good science fiction, melee is still a thing in this universe. And the fact that it is 
makes me happy. <laughs> he is no longer raging. No, oh, I like it. Same thing with 40k, man. The fact that there's melee in that, it's just oh, it's so good. Mwah. And that's the end of the video. Hooray! Any parting remarks? Anything else to say before uh, before we end off? Uh, no. No? Oh my god, you're so boring. <laughs> Great content. All right, well, that's going to conclude this video. The next time, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. I will give you a surprise, however. You aren't going to know what the episode is, and I'm going to torture you by quizzing you on uh, a few quotes and a few uh, little information tidbits here and there. I'm going to force you to guess at what we're going to do before we do it. So, have fun with that. And to all the people in the chat, I will give you a hint. They like to use assault mechs. A lot. All right, and that's that. I hope you've had a wonderful day. Thank you for watching Science Insanity. Goodbye.